Tales of Rending Ring fans, it's your main man Transit Cell here, leader of the Transit Knights of the Roundtable of Company One. Subscribe to the Spin Move. And we're here with another episode of Tales of Rending Rings. Episode 10. Episode review. Now, this episode of Tales of Rending Rings was different than anything. This is unrelated, completely unrelated to my mini rant from last week on y'all ass. But I have been very much wrong about so many things when it came to how I believe this season was closing for a lot of the shows. And out of all my predictions for the shows I have been covering, I have not been more wrong than right now. And my voice sounds weird, I'm getting kind of sick. My throat has been sore for a whole week and now I'm sneezing. Apologies. But not just to skip too near the end, but yeah, uh, the Abyss King has been resurrected. Bro, what? Me and Old Sage Grandpa was on the same type of time, man. I mean, yeah, he was coming back, but we were going to get the freaking rings first. My, like, did we forget to swipe the main character card or something? What's going on, bro? And also, something I was definitely very much wrong about was the fact that, well, actually, no, let me put it like this. I never actually watched the opening for this show. A lot of times these days, you see an opening enough times and you kind of skip it. But for me, I actually have only probably seen the opening for the show two times, and that's like near the beginning of the show. So me walking into this episode, straight up believing that we was going to at least see or be introduced to the fifth girl, I checked the opening out. Which makes a lot of my comments from last week kind of dumb. I mean, the comments I was making about the sleepwear and the lingerie, pretty much that being some kind of big reveal. Nah, they wore that in the opening, I just was ill-informed and ignorant. I should have learned this by now from Gushing Over Magical Girls and Metallic Rouge, but yeah, if you want to see panties, you gotta watch the opening. In 2024, rules have changed. So despite me, yes, again, seeing the last girl in the opening, and apparently she uses lighting? That was the only chance to see her this week, because she was not in this episode whatsoever. And not only did we step away from the almost filler that we was last week to get right back into it, we got back into the plot for real, as in THE plot, and signifying that by this Stussy season is... This episode was zero fan service. Kind of. Almost. For opening the credits, zero fan service. But that being said, happy Saturday. This is probably the most non I did see coming episode I had this week. And this beat the dragon showing up in Delicious and Dungeon. But getting into it for real, we are still trying to travel to this kingdom of dwarves for three days. I debunked a lot of negative views and feelings on Saito last week, but I am not used to him complaining this much. <laughs> However, complaining as much as him is Saphir, who does a fair share of complaining in this episode. Now, this is my fault for say thinking this and saying this, but you know her being a dragon people, her being able to transform into some kind of monster. There was a lot of expectations, at least thoughts I walked in with Saphir that I kind of thought about. And without getting too much into it, I'm kind of wrong here again, because apparently she has damn near zero stamina. Now, her excuse later on for not turning into a monster then is because of the lack of water that's in that city. I can kind of agree with that. Pretty much thanks to the Incredibles. You know you know. But her complaining about the distance, complaining about the type of girls that we have here, and as well as not even wanting to explore the city at all once we actually got there, so that she doesn't want to wander aimlessly. Girl, get your ass moving. Uncharacteristically, Grand Art has no problem <laughs> moving around right now because we've seen her in action, definitely. And the Fretis, I guess she's the one who actually does make sense. And it's weird because I don't really put that on elves, but yeah, she has no problem moving around. She's full of energy, and yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna tell people that 54 is your prime. Come see me in another quarter century. I'll fuck you up. Now, one of the nights they set up camp, there was a conversation between Saito and Grandpa. Saito, for some reason, doubts that the fire the rings is important. And he kind of wonders how everybody else is feeling about that because they didn't they really take it as a big deal, as it seems. It's been a long time since the Kingdom of Light. But the old sage grandpa does reassure him, because basically he's like, you know, people's going to have their opinions anyway, because if they didn't expect the Ring King to show up in the first place, they're going to try to find their own means to fight it back, because they're not just going to roll over and let their Miss King stop on them. Which you cannot be mad at. But reassure Saito, if Destiny does believe that the Ring King, that, excuse me, if Destiny does say that the Miss King is coming back, Destiny should also say that the Ring King is coming back. Was this not epic foreshadowing? And yes, they do eventually make it to the Kingdom of Drawers, however, it is straight up deserted and destroyed. Even pretty much nothing to really see. And while even he may have her moments where she thought she heard something and heard somebody from probably watching the following them, well, when we ended up at the end of this episode, that wouldn't be an to nothing. Maybe not right now, but bruh. We also come to find that apparently, according to Grand Art, this kingdom is really right next to the Abyss King's headquarters, per se, where they're actually at. So, if this town got wiped out for real, for real, it's probably because of the Abyss monsters and whatnot. Or living next door to something like that had to be terrifying and everybody moved away. Take your pick on that one. 
there is a rather funny scene of Grandheart talking to Sophia. Sophia trying to just sit down, and Grandheart was gonna kneel down and carry Sophia, which Sophia found very much embarrassing. I tried to say this episode was zero fan service, but Grandheart and all that is. I'm typically a believer of people's regular outfits not necessarily being as fan service, and they always travel around like that, aka he made with her red bra and cleavage always on display. But there's times you also gotta look at it and it's kinda just like, yeah, Grandheart's just big old round ass being out all day. It, 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 it's just 24 7 thirst. Big booty hole! Nah, let me stop. Now we roll up on this giant room, tomb, castle? I don't know what that was. This is for clues and answers that we end up walking in there and apparently we come to find that there's like a robot puppet kind of thing in there. Because apparently the, the drawers was miners and very much industrialists like, is that a word? Mining for materials, wealth, and parts, getting a whole bunch of metal going, and actually building their own, like, they was kind of like on that higher level technology than anybody around there. Since this all ended up getting taken down by the Miss King, I'm gonna try hard just to leave this alone, to not make certain references. Black people, you know. But the one of the robots that was on the ground apparently it gets back up and starts attacking. Now, if I can kind of be real, this to me, a lot of this didn't make sense. The Abyss King's rings can work on inanimate objects. This robot thing is not alive. It didn't actually have a soul. It was never actually, like... And then the Ring King is tapping into the, the inner thoughts, inner darknesses inside of it. It wasn't ever alive, right? I mean, you could say it carried the thoughts of the people that was there because they, they what, what happened was it carried the jealousy and the envy of every other kingdom being able to thrive still besides this kingdom and saying they should perish along with us, which does how to answer the question. Yeah, some may have moved away, but a lot of them did not. You can say that was going on here. It's just like the means to get there just did not make no sense. Thanks for clarifying, but what in the blue hell? But after the great sage smashed the wall that this knight tried to put Saito in, and another strong kiss from Hime, allowing Saito to use the Ring of Light's powers, we handsomely deal with this abyss knight. <laughs> Look back at the beginning of the episode too, we have come a long way. But I had to call that the last easy W policy possible or simply the trigger, because once this knight goes down, the ring disappears. The abyss ring. As well as the two abyss rings that the old sage has with him. And the two abyss rings that was left in the elf's country. Or was it Sephir's country? I don't remember. Probably Sephir thinking about it now. All those rings being the five rings that the Abyss King owns. This shadowy dark figure that looks like a freaking rare hunter from Yu-Gi-Oh. Fake ass black KKK looking ass. You're starting to piss me off. I don't think it's on purpose, but do you know what you're doing? Anyways, these five rings end up on the, the Abyss King's finger, finger, fingers and he's sitting in that throne. I don't even know where this throne is at right now, but he has officially been revived. We lost the gamble, everybody. We was wrong. The Abyss King beat us to it. Starting the uprising of a whole bunch of monsters right outside with us they need to take care of. Now with the help of Saito, the old sage, Grand Art, and Mars, and we are able to at least get past these monsters, at least escape. But that's before we see a huge wall of multiple of the Abyss King soldiers, bunch of Abyss King monsters, this regular, they're more like humanoid, ogre looking type monsters, but so many more of those than the monster, big old monsters we got behind us, and we're just cornered as fuck. Like, duh. That was worse than an army of coolers that was about to roll up on Goku and Vegeta in that one movie. Rest in peace, Akira Toyama. At this point, Grandpa officially realizes that the Abyss King has been resurrected, we've lost, and yeah, we're screwed. So what he ends up doing, long story short, with a huge speech involved, yes, but he sends Saito and his four wives at the time back to the real world. He was going to send Mars as well, but Ron shut down the portal light, and he said he was going to fight for this world to the very end, like he always has said. Grandpa even calling Hime, Himeno, her actual name. Her actual name is Crystal, but okay. And damn, this should be crazy. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I didn't expect all that. We get to the last city, everything's fucked, no girl around, no wife here, no wife here, no ring here, the Miss King all of a sudden shows up and we're fucked, game over, roll credits. That was this episode, man. Bruh, like I know this was episode 10, we only got two weeks left for the show, but come on, man. It's just trying to wrap this up for real, for real. But that being said, I do have a handful of theories. They haven't been wrong enough, right? <laughs> but it comes down to the still, the last girl we haven't seen. The Ring of Earth. Wow, no shit. This entire time we've been in another world. Saito has left his world to come here. And while I never looked at it from a different planet perspective, but if we take it there just for a moment, if we're truly away from that world and being back in this world means being back on Earth, wow. 
It's kind of like one of those things from Undead and Unluck that kept happening last week. Well, yesterday, rather. It's not exactly a big, big reveal. It's just like, we should have just really came through this the entire time. And by the time you actually hit about hit with it, you realize you never thought about it, and damn. The Earth girl holding the Earth ring has always been right next to Saito, at least in the general area. And mind you know, Crystal Hime did not play that role because she came from the other world anyway. She just came over here just to hide from the Abyss Kings folks for 10 years. Now, ain't that some shit? <laughs> if we do find her, though, that is true. How we gonna get back, though? We could do something cliche and be like, hey, you got the rings. Open the portal. Let's go! Now, after the ending's done, I guess we do have to at least go over this scene. So, let's head to the back. Could you just, ladies and gentlemen, despite this episode having a huge twist, being more plot than ever, fucking everything up and putting us in the big, most dire situation that we have been the whole time, it would not be Tales of Wedding Rings without a bunch of titties. But of course, full nipples on display. We did get a small scene where we, when we got sent back to the world, Saito realized that we was out there while Hitman was crying about her grandpa and everybody was kind of just looking on. To be fair, I hate to say it, but I think it's really kind of safe to assume that them boy's dead. But let's draw on that next week, because right now we got nipples, bra, panties everywhere. And again, big shout out to Tales of Ready Rings for just not having the same nipples twice. The closest you get to that is the twin sisters. The nipple inequality in this show is real. Chain Soldier almost had it, didn't do it. Those should never magical girls never actually tried. Oh, cattle gals, they got no nipples. Even that Isakai and Ozen pair that well, I haven't seen that since the version of that episode since episode 2. Tales of Random Rings is the difference maker. I know that it's be naive to say he may actually wear the exact same bra and panties over and over again, but she really just keeps saying, wearing like the same high. And yeah, we, uh, under the drawer, she has so many different type of pairs. They had to throw some shots in there though, say that like, your grand arts and <laughs> the freckless bras that they perceive too small. We didn't see it from the back, but you might as well give grand art a thought. <laughs> Girl not out there in pink bra and panties. Bro, I falling off. They get the friend did some dark purple panties with some yellow lace. Interesting. They get Sophia some light purple. Damn near pink. Of course, here comes he made with the dark red and black lace that she's so accustomed to, which apparently everybody always sees because it's apparently on display. Of course, Grandma's the one to point that out who you pretty much will assume is damn near never wearing underwear. It was kind of weird though when Saito walked back in on them and apparently the only person that was still in the same underwear like that with a bra falling on Saito's face was Hime. Were this supposed to be two different kind of scenes? Like, why did everybody all of a sudden get undressed? To be fair, I mean, outside that sleepwear episode we had yesterday where everybody was kind of in like that group, like... Besides Hime, is underwear really a thing? Granite, again, let's just assume she doesn't. The Francis was underneath that cloak that she normally was like she, when she first drew up on Saito many episodes ago and there is a stigmatism here and there where elves don't wear panties. Sophia's outfit kind of leaves much to be desired up top when it comes to that. Maybe wear panties underneath, but we might as well just assume since she does admit that she walks around naked from time to time in her kingdom. The concept of underwear may be completely new to these girls and I don't think they like it. <laughs> kind of like some of those beach ashy episodes where they have swimsuits but they couldn't have different swimsuits on and they want to wear regular swimsuits instead of being gawked at. However, there's a moment later on when they decide, decide to try to skip these swimsuits on for a second. That's the fan service that be directed towards the fans per se, or the main dude involved. You want to see us in this type of outfit, this type of underwear, this type of shit? There you go. But we typically don't. So screenshot it and call it a day. Country World doesn't do screenshots. Go on Twitter and call it a day. I also like when Saito walked in and pretty much saw everybody damn near naked. He did nobody even bad eye for real, for real. At this point, it's pretty much like, oh, Saito's watching? Keep on. To be fair, it's competition, right? He may was a little bit flustered though. There is an elephant in the room here, and I don't want to make this video that much longer, but I guess I'll at least point it out. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, yes. Even though we did not beat the Abyss King yet, Saito said to wait till they get back in their world. They're in their world. I disagreed with y'all a lot last week, true. However, the conditions have been met. Saito, he may, you gotta do or you don't. Rest of the video, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Like this video for me, and I'll see y'all. Subscribe to the Spit Booth.